Good day, everyone. This one is on vitamin D and its effect on testosterone levels. Um, we'll just look at one study initially, which is a, a Dutch study, um, and try to understand how, why we've got such diverse sort of information out there. I mean, you'll find studies that actually say, well, it doesn't really have much of an effect. And others that say, yep, it does have an effect. It does really it does really depend on the underlying um, sort of status of people that are included in the studies, and then it does affect you know the the level as well. So there's a number of factors, but it's really important to sort of look at these and sort of uh, sort of work through the details. Anyway, I'll just show you the first one. Now, this one's a Dutch study, and it was done, um, it was actually published in the Clinical Endocrinology um, magazine in 2015. And this was basically the objective, possible association between serum 25, um, OHD, and testosterone levels. Um, has been reported. However, contradictory results have emerged. So they basically say, well, a lot of reports and a lot of other studies have sort of looked at this and actually come up with a conclusion that, you know, T levels seem to go up when you've got a good vitamin D status. These guys are basically saying, well, we've got contradictory um, results and there's some other people that have got contradictory results, but let's take a look and see what the design is. To investigate a causal link between vitamin D and testosterone status, we studied the effect of vitamin D supplementation on serum testosterone concentrations in three independent intervention studies, including male patients with heart failure, which was study one, um, male nursing home residents, um, uh, study two, and male non-Western immigrants in the Netherlands, study three. So we've got three different groups. Now, method. In the study one, 92 subjects were randomized to either vitamin D 2000 IUs and or a control. Blood was drawn at baseline after three and six weeks in study two. And so, you know, they sort of concluded there wasn't much of an increase. In study two, 49 um, uh, vitamin D deficient subjects. So remember, this is this second group is males in nursing home residency. And they basically these people are deficient in vitamin D. And they were actually given 600 IUs daily or the placebo. Now 600 is just enough to deal with rickets. Not enough, it's far too low, 600. And somebody that's deficient already, giving them 600 is just like, you know, it's zilch. It just basically covers that deficiency at a bare minimum, 800 IUs is, you know, if you go out in the sun, you'll get 10,000 to 20,000 IUs. So it's just ridiculously low. So we can basically just say that these are people that are living in a nursing home, group one, and basically they are being given such a low dose that it is completely irrelevant at that level. The first group in the first study are people with heart failure. I would suspect all these people are quite overweight. And I would suspect that, um, you know, they're quite unhealthy. So they've got a whole lot of, you know, endocrine problems and stuff like that going on and hormonal problems. So, you know, you don't get that sick with heart failure problems if you don't have, a, you know, quite a bit of weight, quite a bit of insulin resistance and a quite a lot of things. So even though they were given 2000 IUs, not, not enough. I mean, we've seen people taking 
thousands that I've, I've, I use. I remember one, um, uh, for instance, person that I sp that was uh, on my channel actually mentioned that, you know, one of these relatives had taken a hundred thousand I use and still didn't fix the status because they were overweight and it was all a lot of that was going into the fat cells being stored. So sometimes dysregulation as well can play a role. Other nutrients, you need a certain level of magnesium, certain a number of other nutrients in order to do a lot of the conversions. So if you don't have a lot of that, what happens is the body will just put it away into storage into your fat cells. So somebody's that's unhealthy is probably going to have low magnesium status. They're going to have a lot of deficiencies, underlying deficiencies that are involved in a lot of the actual enzymatic pathways that are required to do all the conversions in order to basically get the active form. So there's a lot of factors at play. We're not talking about healthy people here. We're talking about really sick people with a lot of underlying issues. And I was just saying, if they're overweight, a lot of these people with heart failure, you know, they would have enough adipose tissue to absorb, you know, a lot of this. This would be so little for people. You know, these people should be at a minimum up to, you know, anywhere between 20 to 50,000 IUs. We're talking about many orders of magnitude to basically deal with their deficiency. And these people are all deficient. People don't become this sick without a number of deficiencies. So that's a sort of, now we've got the third group. Now these are immigrants. And so blood was again, between these groups was drawn at baseline eight and 16 weeks, the study um, three, um, that was the previous one. And the study three had 43 participants. These are quite smaller numbers as well. So you can't really infer a lot of statistical relevance with such small groups. Yes, they're interventional studies, so they are controlling slightly, but you know, I've already pointed some of the inadequacies. One, the first one is too low for those sort of sick people. The second one is far too low at a level of, you know, where people are in nursing homes, vitamin D deficient, they've actually told us that. So even if they're thin, they're still vitamin D deficient. 600 IUs is just a drop in the ocean, irrelevant, and uh, probably also have some underlying micronutrient malnourishment as well. So without checking, we don't know. But um, I suspect because uh, a lot of uh, other studies have shown that with people in nursing homes and people with severe insulin resistant diseases, they tend to have a lot of micronutrient deficiencies. So, um, you know, it's like getting vitamin C in the actual, your cells. Well, if you've got, if you've got insulin resistance, it's going to be a bit of a problem. If you're not, and you're on a carnival diet, even small amounts will get in at much higher concentrations. And we've seen that uh, with carnivals having much higher levels of, of good vitamin D C status, where people that are taking supplements and are sick and are insulin resistant have much lower and even have low grade scurvy and problems, uh, you know, skin problems and all sorts of things, like a lot of diabetics have and even end up losing limbs to amputation because they're so sick. So we these are sick populations or very elderly, frail, with a lot of deficiencies, you know, so there's a lot of issues here. Um, and then the let's go to, into the third group. So we'll cover that as well. Uh, let's, let me just go through the in study three, as we said, received either vitamin D at 1200 IUs or placebo. 1200 IUs is just, that's too low. Um, blood was drawn. I suspect these, these uh, and blood was drawn at eight to 16. Serum levels were measured. Um, they use rodeo immuno assays, which is fairly, you know, I'm not in, in, in any way criticizing the methods, good methods. Testosterone levels were measured using second generation, um, uh, the immunoassays. And these are the sort of results. So level, 
between the different groups significantly increased in all treatment groups. Medium increase was 27, 30, and 36 um, in terms of the respective studies. Now, let me just convert that as well. Now, these were probably, you know, people from a number of maybe African countries, a number, I'm just thinking the sort of ex-colonies that, uh, um, that a lot of the, um, the Netherlands had, and a lot of these immigrants would be from those sort of areas who are much darker skin, so they would be already, I suspect, deficient anyway. So, and when we actually look at these numbers, 27, which is the first group, okay, so, oops, 27. And this is basically um, uh, nanomoles. So we have to, to get it in um, nanograms per milliliter, the other, the conversion that many people know about, you know, which when we talk about like anywhere between 40 and 50 and stuff like that, it's really good levels to have. That is two and a half times. So when we're looking at, let's say the, the Maasai 42, just to give you a, 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 a nanograms, so 2.5, that's about 105, okay? So you get a sort of a bearing now. These ones, 27 times 2.5, oops. 27 divided by 2.5 is about 10.8. So if these people were basically something, you know, like a, around about the 14, you know, deficient, you know, 14 nanograms, this would just put them still in a deficient state. So 10, 11 is about 20 odd, 25, 24, whatever. That's still deficient. You're deficient at that level. Okay. So, and we don't really know what their, what their average levels were. They're just telling us what they increased by. So, you can actually see already the first group that actually had the highest level of vitamin D uptake had an increase of 27. So a lot of it was actually going to fat cells. To be that low, 10.8 nanograms, I would say a lot of that, those unhealthy people with heart failure would have been basically taking a lot of that in the fat cells. Too many fat cells absorbs more. The other group, that got um, 30, so 30 divided by 2.5, it's about 12. And uh, they were probably at similar, very low levels, plus 14 or, you know, 26. Still way too low, you know. You're still just getting, you, you, you're marginally between the normal and the deficiency level in nanograms. And 36, I've seen actually a levels like 12 nanograms amongst immigrant, you know, dark skin populations. So even 36, divide that by 2.5 to get plus 12, it still just puts them at the below level of sort of normal, you know, that barely just covers a lot of other functions, not enough to basically really have an effect on the, on the, um, on T levels, you know, because remember vitamin D acts as a hormone and acts for over, you know, a thousand odd um, biological functions. The body's going to prioritize a whole lot of things before it starts prioritizing big levels, of big boosts to buy to, you know, to T levels at the, because these people would be quite deficient, all of these groups for a number of different reasons that I've explained. So, So these are the age ranges of the different groups and all that. And these are the levels that they were able to get them to. So they're nothing, nothing exceptional. You know, these are low um, uh, sort of, sorry, up here. 
these groups didn't really achieve anything spectacular in that regard. Okay. So they haven't achieved anything really spectacular in terms of 25 OHD in that regard. These are the sort of different levels that they actually recorded. Nothing spectacular in terms of increases. We'll leave that for a sec for this study and we'll go to this study. This one was actually done in the US. And they actually noticed a very different picture. They actually looked at their, you know, like these different levels, total, total testosterone, sort of levels and all that through the year and stuff like that. But what they did notice is these sort of things. How there is a, a good statistical relationship between an increase in vitamin D. It sort of plateaus out at this put sort of point once you get, you know, at these levels of a probably 105 or whatever. So 105, which is about 42, which is basically where the sort of Maasai are at 42 nanograms per um, uh, um, milliliter. So that's sort of very similar type, type levels that we're actually talking about in that regard. So that's when, and it's about here that they said about 70, you know, 75 to, Yeah, this sort of level. So anything below that, not so good. So that was the sort of levels where they had noticed a case where the sort of level sort of going up and then at that higher level, it sort of plateaus out. So and we can see that both that relationship with total testosterone and also free testosterone. Remember free testosterone, um, free is about, you know, 3%. It's not a very large amount of the total t testosterone, but it's really important. Remember those receptors are um, in the prostate, very important free testosterone. So you have to have good status to have, so that 3% is much higher. So when you're very deficient, you're going to have very little of that. It explains probably the reason why as people get older, their prostate enlarges because those enzymes that are required to suppress that growth and keep it in more normal constraint levels from growth because it's got a lot of growth factors. The way it actually works it needs to be contained and get kept under control is probably one reason why both breast and prostate tissue tend to have, um, uh, you know, with the insufficient vitamin D tend to basically be more susceptible to these sort of growth enzymatic pathways, which can tend to basically, if you've got underlying susceptibility, genetic susceptibility to prostate or um, breast cancer. So when we look at this sort of level in terms of vitamin D, and that's the free one, which is really important for those sort of functions. And that actually goes even higher. So it's sort of about around about the 105 and even pretty good at, um, at slightly higher levels on that. And again, very similar to that 85. So just to give you an idea, so 75, what about 2.5, that's about 30 nanograms. So that's that initial, where we, we initial start coming up, this there's 75. 
which is about there, to about 80, and then it plateaus out largely. Problem is up here, they didn't have enough statistically, you know, like really to basically um, maintain, they knew it was a sort of a plateau, but not enough people, you know, it can have a slight effect, but generally speaking, there is a sort of a dose dependency here. So 85, 2.5, so between 30 and 34 is that lower um, part. You can see the other guys that didn't even get close to, you know, they'd marginally got to that those sort of levels. Um, so they would be just below that in the 20 odds, the high 20s or mid 20s. So they wouldn't have even got even anywhere close to this low level, which is between 30 and 34 nanograms um, per milliliter, where which the European sort of standard, the metric system, the other one is nanomoles per liter. So that's the thing, the conversion is 2.5, two and a half, just so people know what that is. And so it's the same picture here that's slightly higher, you're looking at the storage form. So, you know, about close to the middle and that would be, okay, 25 divided by two plus 75, about 87 and a half, divide that by 2.5. It's about 35 um, uh, nanograms per deciliter. Um, per milliliter. So that's the sort of thing you should be aiming somewhere between the 35 and the 42, which is basically the Maasai level. If you're aiming between there, you're going to get good levels um, of, you know, supporting testosterone from vitamin D. If you are deficient, you will have, remember vitamin D receptors in the, when you get, um, you know, your balls, there's quite a few vitamin D receptors there, mate, guys. So, you know, believe me, it does play a role. It, it, you know, nature wouldn't have put those vitamin D receptors there just for, just for a joke or for a laugh. And so I've actually found this image and... This is sort of a vitamin vitamin D and the status. And you actually see these, these are sort of a, this is from sort of a sort of a like a meta-analysis type study, which have looked at these a number of different things. So you can actually see all these low levels, which is sort of the the, the real deficiency levels in nanograms per um, milliliters which is, you know, what a lot of people find themselves in these sort of low levels if they're in nursing homes, or if they're basically quite sick, um, if they're darker skinned, which have, um, which they're more indoors or in colder climates, they're not in their traditional lands where there will be less, um, less clothing on and have better exposure to the sun and get, you know, they, a person who is a dark skin can, require up to six times the amount of time outdoor to get the same level. So I can be out for, you know, like half an hour and get 10,000 IUs. And that person would require like six times that. So you can actually see that's three hours. And if you wanted to get like good levels, you'd require six hours compared to one hour for somebody with a with a with a lighter skin. So you can actually see that there's a there's a massive different requirement. So you can actually understand why these immigrant populations being in colder climates that are coming from those would be quite deficient. So even 1200 just doesn't cut it. It doesn't fix the deficiencies. The levels that they were dealing with for those populations do not and that's the sort of stuff that they use. They go, "Oh, look at this. Well, you haven't fixed the deficiency." You haven't proven anything. All you've said is basically you've marginally improved the deficiency and then didn't see any effect on testosterone. But all the other studies that have been done have actually have been done. And these and this is, you know, this over 26.51, 26.51, 26.51, 26.51. 
which would be 26.51 times 2.5, which is about 66. Obviously, we saw that you know you need to get up to 75 to 85 level um, uh, in uh, you know nanomoles per litre. So you have to get to those um, slightly higher levels, but this is an average of everybody above this level. So everybody, this is a sort of an you know an average out. So you know there's probably other people that are much higher than that level, okay? Because that's because it's greater than. See all these sort of levels, absolute piss poor you really have to be at higher levels to basically see significant increases in total testosterone. That's when you do. You can't basically not sort out a deficiency and it can take some time. You know, it can take a number of weeks to fix a deficiency, sometimes months. And these people were actually given very low doses. So it just doesn't cut it. But this is the sort of research we get, unfortunately. Um, and while the others, didn't have to basically even put a statement there. They didn't even put a statement there about conflict of interest, but these people actually had, and you can actually see. Look at all these bio, um, pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, um, Nov Novartis, you know, you name it. It's quite a bit, a bit of big pharma there. And they would have had a, an influence on the design. They wouldn't have told them what to do, how to run it, but they would have said, well, you know, we want to, you know, the standard within the standard of care test. And that's what they did. These low doses, you know, which is what is recommended. You know, most of, most of the actual out there is anywhere between different countries, 600 to 2,000 I use. Most of them don't even get to, it's very few countries that get to 2,000 I use. So it's very low. So they were using that band of what is recommended out there. But the reality is we know that these are committees just to cover rickets or stuff like that. It's not based on the best science. Unfortunately, like a lot of things, like the LDL thing, like many things, it's not based on the best science out there. And unfortunately, this is the result we get when um, we've got people that are very sick, deficient, very severely deficient, you know, from in nursing homes, people with heart failure and people from with darker skins because they're coming from an immigrant population and, you know, non-Western immigrants. We know that from the Netherlands colonies that they would come from, they are darker skinned. So pretty much it's the results that I expected. To get and that's why when you look at that you, you've got to basically it's one thing of looking at a study and another thing is actually breaking it apart looking at all the pieces and considering all the actual groups you know and what are the underlying you know they actually mentioned about the second group that was deficient in a nursing home because they actually checked on that but the other groups never really got checked but we know that you know immigrant population you know you know you know in a country in a cold climate, they're not on vitamin D um, supplements. They're not gonna, their status is going to be very low. People with heart failure are going to be overweight and all that. We know that they're going to basically be absorbing. They need much higher levels to get to levels where they can actually, um, you know, reduce the amount being absorbed by adipose tissue. So we know all these things. These are well documented in the literature, but they are being ignored by this group and they are being given very low levels and then go, oh, look, we gave them supplements and didn't do anything for their T levels. Well, we know why. You know, these people were deficient going in and the low levels that they got 
kept them in a deficient state. So why would testosterone go up if you're in a deficient state? And micronutrient deficiencies that these people potentially had, not going to work. So anyway, this is how you have to look at these studies to understand and actually look at the, and nuance them. Understand what are the groups that are being studied? What is their underlying status? When you look at that and understand the underlying status, then you look at the results and go, oh, there's all these confounding variables. And I explain them to you about the skin color, about, you know, certain adipose tissue, about basically, you know, the certain levels that they were given, about people in nursing homes that were already documented as being deficient. And they were giving them sub-levels, you know, like 600 IUs. I mean, God almighty, that just barely covers um, rickets, um, you know, that doesn't fix a deficiency. It's just an absolute joke. But this is the sort of studies they use to basically argue against the supplementation of vitamin D. They say, well, it doesn't work. They do the same thing when they do respiratory infections and all that. It doesn't work. Yeah, well, because you're giving the people, you know, insufficient dosages. It's not basically fixing their status to getting them to uh, an ancestral status. And an ancestral status is basically around 35 to, you know, to, to about 50. That's where the status is. And if you're not within that range, and probably the sweet spot is around the 40, 42, like the Maasai, if you're not in that spot, you're not in a good level. So we need to stop all this nonsense. And this is the confusion. This is the methods, these poor studies that basically, you know, deliberately focus on these groups, give them inadequate levels to fix their deficiency, and then point the finger and say, oh, look, it doesn't work, obviously. It doesn't work because you haven't fixed the deficiency. How can it work? Anyway, that was just a, to get a, a bit of a gist of how the sort of nonsense that happens out there and how basically studies are designed and created to produce these mixed messages or confusing messages or to create murkiness out there. It's the sort of typical sort of stuff we've seen, you know, of in academia that basically is compromised to some extent and conflicted and uh, you know do these poor studies i mean this is a poor study you know if you're going to do an interventional study do a proper interventional study give small and large in these groups have a group that gets a certain level a higher level and a very high level and i would say you would see dramatic differences in the results but by basically having a a very low vitamin d um group and a control group, they're both going to be deficient at the end. So all you're actually proving is that if you're deficient, your testosterone isn't going to go up <laughs> because all the other studies where people were not deficient, their testosterone went up. So, you know, the only confounding variable is here. It didn't give them enough of a dose to fix their deficiency. So there's... No, you know, um, you know, this sort of argument, contradictory results have emerged. You know, go and toss yourself off in a corner, mate. You know, these people are just basically playing with words deliberately to cause this sort of confusion. They're actually, these are things that misanthropists do, that people that basically have no care, they're more interested about their careers, they're more interested in satisfying big pharma, and all these sort of groups who tend to give them the dosh, you know, and look after them and they get their trips and all sorts of things. If you're a good scientist that actually puts out good research and says how an ancestral diet is healthy for you, how being in the sun, doctors knew this years ago. You know, the old hospitals, they used to wheel them out in the sun because they knew how therapeutic the sun was in vitamin Ds. You know, but since big pharma and big agra have taken over the food, you know, and, uh, you know, what's required in terms of nutrition and stuff like that, it's all gone to shit. Research 
this is the sort of research we can expect. 99% of it is this sort of garbage where they're deliberately designing studies to basically make these things fail, really. I mean, this is how you need to look at these sort of things and consider sort of the population groups that they're studying. And when you understand these confounding and how they're still deficient anyway, then you realise, oh, I mean, bullshitted exactly you are. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this. Have a good day. See you.